Uh, good evening. From my perspective here in Finland, it's now 6 p.m. and you might be anywhere in the world, but it looks like by the names that may you are somewhere close by. Uh, the talk and the session that I want to do with you today is on something that is very uh, dear to my heart in the sense that I work at Vaisala as a principal test engineer and one of things that I've needed to change and help people change is this idea that laboratory testing and automated testing are somehow two separate things. They're actually not. Uh, exploratory testing uh, is this idea where you are designing your tests and you're executing your tests kind of like as a united pair so that uh, between the designing of your tests and, and running of it, uh, you can learn you can change, you can enhance things. There's absolutely no other way of creating good automation than exploratory testing that I know of. Uh, when we try doing it so that we separate manual test writing to some people and the automation people try reading uh, those manual test cases and turning them into automation. That usually turns out bad for both parties and not good for the company. So what I've been working on for the last year and a half, very intensely at Vaisala, is this idea that no matter who joins my team, they can learn to do what I call contemporary exploratory testing, which means that they can learn to contribute in automation as part of the work they are doing uh, uh, in exploring, and whoever is already really good at automating uh, can still grow in being better at coming up with the various ways that we need to test our application so that it reveals all the relevant information. And instead of me kind of delivering this talk to you in slides, what I want to do today is, is just kind of you know go on the, the demo end. That's what was the idea of, of today a few slides. Uh, we might come back to some of them, but what I wanted to do is actually test a little application with you. And uh, at this point, I wanted to ask if anyone in the audience would be willing to be a uh, pair for me in this session. Uh, what I would then do is what's called a strong style pair programming, uh, meaning you get to be my hands. You don't need to know anything that we're doing. That's my responsibility as the navigator in the strong uh, style pair to say what we're doing and getting us moving forward. But uh, you would be helping me kind of move through the, the thing in a paired fashion rather than leaving me all alone on, on doing this. Is anyone willing to uh, try out uh, screen sharing and actually do the exercise with me? You can uh, raise your hand or you can just kind of like shout out in the, the chat if you would like to try that. Uh, it might be that in a session like this that gets recorded, it's a little bit intimidating. It's still fun. I, I recommend that. So if you are at all feeling like you might want to try it, please kind of like just let me know. And if you don't want to do that, then, you know, I use my own hands. Uh, I am usually stronger in a pair rather than the, the other way. Around. So. I always uh, uh, love to do that. Uh, can we uh, promote Sharon uh, to the, the uh, panelists so that I can give her access to my, my computer? Can you hear me, uh, Rimbras? Uh, can you yes, promote Sharon to a panelist? Yes, yes, I we can do that. Just a second. So that she gets voice and, and control. Basically, while we are uh, getting uh, Sharon there set up, uh, I'll just show you what I, uh, what I start or what we will uh, start from. We have a little application. I use this for teaching purposes. This is created by Alan Richardson. And it's a lovely application for exploratory testing purposes uh, and contemporary exploratory testing purposes for the reason that it actually has a domain that is not very complicated, but it's uh, unknown to most people. 
So it requires domain understanding so that you could properly test. So unless you are learning about the application and are curious about the application and what's right and what's wrong, you won't notice the problems of this. Uh, but it's also implemented uh, with the some of the simpler technologies for automation purposes, and it has very nicely placed IDs on uh, on the user interface on the page, so we can actually automate uh, against it uh, quite easily. But did we get Saren yet promoted? Not yet, at least. So this is the application that we will be using. Just let me know when you can find a way of promoting Sharon. I don't know if I have the access to that. No, I, don't. I think we have Sharon as panelist. Yes. Okay, I now it's good. Hi, Sharon. Awesome. Hi. <laughs> so we can then move. Uh, you should be able to click your Zoom screen and yes. you are then on my computer. So mm -hmm. how would you like to test this? Any um, ideas? You know, I, I can tell you, but you can also give me an idea of if you got a completely new application, how would you try approaching it? Do you have any ideas? Uh, I just have a quick look here at the text um, just to see what this about. Um, right, without the verb to be, okay. Do you want to master E prime? Uh, user online to check your writing, word count, discourage words, possible violations. Check for E prime. Yeah. So we have kind of like a simple, very little application. Uh, we're trying to apparently, as, as per the text, I of course already know a little bit more about the application, avoid in the right English, we want to avoid the to be and all of its forms. That's what E prime is about. The mm -hmm. link there, uh, if you click on the link, can you please click on the link? Mm -hmm. There's oh, the, the link. E prime link. Yeah. yeah. Us to a Wikipedia page that gives us too much to read right now. So we do not want to start reading this. So let's just go back to our application. But it gives us an idea that you know we can read a lot more about the domain of this application uh, if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. But kind of you know, true to exploratory testing, what we want to do is we want to do something with the application, and you're just clicking on the for e prime actually already taught us some, at least I learned. Uh, out of that, that uh, the the there's a number coming after each of the the word count discouraged words possible violations. Mm -hmm. So it's somehow counting things. So now we would need some some relevant text. You have an idea of what we could try as a as a text here. Well, I could just do a simple text with um, you know a few words just to see what happens. And uh, um... yeah, well, let's actually do a simple text. You can write whatever uh, is on your mind as the simple text right now. And if you're uncomfortable, you know, coming up with that, of course, I'm happy to help you on, on that one. But yeah. just, you know, any English thing, <laughs> you decide whether you want to avoid the verb to be or, or include it in your sentence. Yeah. Oh. Simple. A sentence. It's good enough. So again, you know, like just starting to explore this little application, we are now learning that if we put in something like this is a sentence, it marks the to be verb on red, it counts that as a discouraged word, and kind of like, you know, learning focused, we are probably wondering what is this possible violation? Do you have any ideas on how we could figure out what's a possible violation? That's a difficult one. Yeah, I'm not really um, in the the zone yet here. <laughs> okay. So let's go to the, the um, actually no, let's, let, well, I was thinking well, we can go into the uh, the specification. Let's go into that one. Yeah. And just okay. browse through the spe specification. There's, uh, there's some examples here somewhere. So if you browse down a bit more here. Okay. So a little bit more down. Oh yes, I can see here. Yes, uh, let's take that contractions thing, the I am, you are, we are, uh, theirs, here's that that type, like the, the, okay. uh, the italic part of it. Let's copy paste that into our application. Like it's, it seems like it's a nice example, like the whole, uh, all the way to the end. Yeah, that's actually a nice, let's mm -hmm. paste that and put it into our application. So we don't just have to kind of like use our imagination and all of these. Uh, did control C work for you? 
Well, I'm just, yeah, control C seems to work, but I don't know if control P is going to work. Or control V. Control V, I mean, yeah. That is let's, not. Let's just move. Uh, I'll take the control for a moment. Yeah, I'll okay. just move us between the. Uh, actually, it's easier for you to move on the other window because the Zoom is, is hiding that from me now. Okay. But thank I you. can have that. So I'll give the control back to you. So if you click on the window, you have again the control. Thank you. Okay. So I'll check for E prime. Okay. So we are learning what the contract, uh, what possible violations are. Do you have an idea on, on what you see here, what they might be? So anything with anything a, a, a is it with an uh, uh, a, a a what's this a uh, the little uh, um, apostrophe <laughs> apostrophe thank <laughs> you apostrophe s yes. anything with that it seems to be categorizing as a possible violation rather than uh, as a discouraged word so it seems like if uh, un uh, uncertain whether it's uh, a possessive versus if it is a um, a uh, an action against E prime, then it categorizes them differently. So kind of like you know, it's a bit of exploring uh, for us to understand what the application is about. Okay. But what we basically want to do is uh, we want to explore this effectively. And I believe very strongly in the contemporary exploring that we can't actually explore effectively unless we are making. First of all, we need to make notes of what kind of things we're doing, and there's no better way of making notes in the modern world automation. So uh, what I want to do is to create a single test case out of your very first, this is a sense example. And uh, well, I actually have two choices. You choose whether you would like to do this in Playwright or in Robot. I have both of them set up here in the, on the computer. Robot framework or Playwright, do you have any preference? If you haven't used either one of them, then you know I can make the choice. I haven't used either. <laughs> so. Do you have a preference? Which one would you like to experience today? Because I'm going to be the one who is supposed to be the expert on that anyway. Okay, pl playwright maybe. Thank you. So then that's uh, the Visual Studio Code is, is the environment that we want to use. So let's go into uh, Visual Studio Code. It's open already down there. So I have uh, a thing set up uh, for us as a starting point. Uh, which basically uh, is just the possibility of seeing that we can open the page in, in Playwright. So if you uh, write on the command line, if you uh, uh, write, uh, actually uh, just press uh, arrow up so you can get the, the thing that I wrote last. So we wanted to uh, actually two arrows up because apparently I cleared. So we wanna run this test uh, and that's all. So let's run that and see that, you know, we get the visual of uh, we are on the right web page. I made this uh, slower for demo purposes, and we probably are going to want to make it uh, faster again at some point. I also made the, the, the browser for demo purposes. Uh, so that's the setup that I've done. Not many lines of code here that I have written as a starting point. So what we basically want to do is now we want to isolate the, the thing that we did and make computer do it. So make notes of how did we test our very first test case. So what's the first thing that we, we were doing on the page after we opened the page? We were looking at the information on the page and we clicked the link. Yeah, we were looking at that. Maybe we don't care so much on all that, especially since that doesn't feel like it's the most expansive thing on automation. Uh, the test case you identified where we wrote some text. Yeah. And uh, then we uh, checked the number in our heads whether they match that would be like a good candidate for automating so let's do that mm -hmm. if you go on the end of the line five and you add a new line uh, you probably need to click on the the zoom window so that you have the focus in the right place yeah i yeah there we go <laughs> so uh it's uh, uh i have the github co-pilot here so it's going to you proposals this page dot click is not the right one that's a little bit too simplistic so let's put page dot so if you write uh, that you can just write on top of the the gray thing isn't really there yet okay yeah so sorry now i um find it a difficult to control that there now okay here I, we are i moved you back there so okay. if you do page dot fill 
it seems to be uh, not agreeing where your mouse is. So, so somehow your mouse is not quite where you think it. Okay, be. here we go. I just clicked. I had to click the mouse on it. Oops. Uh, it lets you only write one letter now, or yeah, at the moment. <laughs> Pay. Right. Uh, does it always require you to click on the mouse on the the screen, or like what's what's going on with that one? It seems that I have to click at the end of the letter each time. Is Let me like try it next one. Now it's working. Now it's working. Now it's working. Okay. No. And now it's again not working. Yeah. So uh, I'll I'll try uh, okay. writing if if it's uh, doing this kind of like a weirdness thing here. So we can do feel and. Uh, then uh, what we'd want to basically fill in is on that page, if we refresh this kind of like as an empty, what was that you wrote? Well, the first thing I did was this is a sentence, just something simple. So we just want this one. We want that filled. And uh, have you automated ever anything against web browsers? Do you know how we can say that, put the, the text here? I haven't done a lot of automation, so um, no, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So if we inspect here, we get to the point of just getting the ID. So we can use that ID input text. Oh, yes. OK. Mm -hmm. I'm now worried about what's going on with that one. Uh, And obviously, I then put the text in there that we wanted. So we could be running it. That's something you should be able to do, even if the, the other controls are making us our life a little difficult. Okay. So, so let's see, just kind of like visually verify, is this doing what we expected it to do? Uh, there's a typo somewhere. I, I, I'm missing the quotes around the input text. Okay. Yeah. So if you you need to click on the the window before it uh, lets you do that. In this sense, uh, Teams is a little bit on bit better on pairing because it lets two people control screen at once. This is kind of if I touch anything, then it takes it away from you, and the other way around. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we ran it. I wasn't paying attention. Did it write the text there? It did. Yes. So, you know, we have now, you know, like we've done two steps of our test case and uh, uh, we can kind of, since the, the uh, uh, controls here are making our life a little difficult, we can just skip forward a little bit. And if you click the linear text of PY, uh, there's a the thing we should have written together if the controls were working. On the left hand side, you can uh, find uh, where the control is right now. It's on the starter test of PY. The I'm sorry. Side, so yeah. Here. The, oh, here, yeah. Um, starter text .py, Yes. If you click open the linear text test .py. Oh, okay. Uh, linear. Yeah. So let's just edit this uh, into having our text uh, instead of that. Well, we can also, of course, use the Hamlet's dilemma, which I used as a as a standard, just in case we have technical difficulties here. So we could use your sentence or we can use this one. Do you have a preference on which one you want to go with? I don't mind. Um, I'm happy to go with whatever. That so, That's fine. Yeah. Uh, you take this text. I'm actually going to just copy paste and just you know move it into where we usually do our exploratory testing. The expected result for this. Is this correct or not? No, because Hamlet's is not. Um, the verb to be. Yeah, it's it's a categorized decibel violation. So kind of depending on if we think of the specification as in like uh, uh, it marks it as, as blue uncertain, then yes. that's fine. But there's mm -hmm. another problem here as well. Would you happen to notice that? How many words do we have there? Oh, yes. OK. <laughs> yeah. So, you yes. know, a lot of time when we are doing multiple things at once. 
in particular in contemporary exploratory testing. We need to slow ourselves down so that we pay attention to things where we notice them. And a lot of times when the tells us that the right answer for this is in, we take it for granted. We document the bugs as they are. And in this particular case, there is already a, a bug in this. So that's our number one bug that we found during this exploratory testing uh, using this, this particular one. And uh, do you have an idea on, on what, what out of our data might cause this? The um, S after Hamlet, the Hamlet part. So uh, actually, let's just explain a little. If you change the text now and yeah. take away the S after Hamlet, does that fix it so that now it's calculating correctly? Yeah, we'll check that. Because a lot of times, you know, we are looking at an application, we're exploring an application, we don't know how it works. And we are just as much automating again, kind of an application. He tells us there's nine words and there's actually only eight words. So where's the problem? So we're it's not the yes. At the culprit. Yeah, so I'm going to try this guy. <laughs> <laughs> if I can delete him. Yeah. And then, yes. Uh, that's that's it. So again, the way that it calculates words is very simplistic, and definitely that is a bug. Uh, but whether we want to then document it in our automation and put a comment around it saying kind of like, yeah, now we make it pass, but this isn't actually how it's supposed to work. And we can imagine you know, writing it get somewhere. That's something that we would probably be doing in real projects that we uh, either leave the whole line out or we just leave a comment for ourselves to notice when it gets eventually fixed. So let's go back to our uh, little test case here uh, on the uh, on this this uh, single thing. So we have now uh, the most straightforward way of implementing one, and we know that unless we are uh, expecting nine, it's going to fail, and we would need to probably say here something like uh, it should really be a write a better word and uh, since i have copilot it thinks it's what i what i want to say so it's it's guessing and i think you know it was more than what i was what i was first writing so we have a a, a simple script so that you should be able to run that so uh on the command line if yep. you now run a uh, pi test uh uh, and then the linear test, so it's under tests. You can't see it how you're writing that down there right now because we have the zoom controls over it. Let me just move this. I'm bothering you a bit on this one. Now the control thing is out of my way. Now you have the control again, or you can take it. So we need the uh, linear tests. There's a typo still linear. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I find it difficult to see a little bit as well. Yeah, small. I'll I'll try fixing it here. So yeah, it's it's not responding very well for yeah, me. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. sometimes really nice, and today for you, uh, not the nicest one. So uh, we ran that test; it passes for us again. It did an uh, awful lot of time. Uh, it's writing the text there, it's checking uh, uh, if we run kind of line by line, we could be able to trust. This. If we want to trust this more, uh, let's just change the, the expected value on the level line nine if from nine to eight and mm -hmm. make sure that we can trust the tool, see it fail. Mm -hmm. The definite thing we want to do on exploring or learning anything, and we are exploring on both the test automation side and on the application side intertwining them simultaneously. So let's just run that. It doesn't let you press enter. There, it's working now, <laughs> slow. Weird. I could just hear the little click on, on it uh, makes me understand that. So again, we can see that the tool seems to be doing uh, the thing that we, we wanted it to do. So, so all is, is fine in that sense. So after we have, you know, in contemporary test, and the first test case is usually the thing that is more difficult to automate. It takes a little bit more of our effort. But after we have the first test case, what we can then do is the power of programming and the built trust that we have on the automated tool by now, 
uh, we can use that and we can build uh, forward on that. So I'll, I'll uh, move us into a new example. So, so that we don't have to write all of these different lines with the, the little tricky technology. To, uh, what I've only added here, well, I've added a possibility of using uh, a sample text if we want to, so that it's already uh, available there. Uh, but for this particular test, I've just moved it into a parametrized test so that uh, the same test case, the Hamlet's dilemma same values are now here. And we get to explore. Uh, we need to decide what other cases we have. So we had your, uh, what was it? This is sentence. It was, this is a sentence, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So we have that and we expect that to get uh, four words. Uh, one that is against E prime very clearly and none that are unclear. Mm -hmm. So if we now would just run this test case here. Write something wrong again. Uh, missing comma, that's my problem. So trying that again. I always need to remember my lists need to have the comma in the end. So we can now run two test cases and now we can start to already feel really impatient with the, the fact that uh, uh, we have to be opening, opening that uh, uh, automation thing again and again. So I think it was, let's just run it from the command line. So I'm just running it from here. So out of tests, we wanted the parameterized tests. So I find that when I'm speaking at the same time, not looking, so we get our first test case and we get our second test case. And, uh, you know, we have time, just like in exploratory testing regularly, we have time to look at what's being on the screen or we can choose to just kind of like mute the screen and not, have. that's again, the choice that we make based on supports our learning. But then the question is, going back to the application, how do we actually test this? So do you have other ideas, uh, other things we could do with the application? What else we could try as inputs to make it show uh, where the problems lie? Does anyone in the audience have any proposals for us? What would you usually do you have any kind of like go-to things that you would test with a question like this? Well, I would check with zero text. I would check with a lot of text. Um, so let's start with zero text. Like again, like one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. So we can go back uh, into our action. So I'm kind of moving the navigator role a little bit more to you and I'm just doing the, the typing here. Mm -hmm. So we want to try empty text and we would expect a line of zeros. Mm -hmm. And uh, at this point, with three test cases, it feels already overwhelming to have to run them all. So running this Y test, it's kind of nice that I can just take the empty thing here and just run that alone. This is something I could not do with a robot framework. I needed to comment out every line. Separately. So I'm kind of moving into, into doing stuff much more in the, the uh, regular programming languages than, than robot framework. So it seems we're getting green out of that. So it's it's giving us at least on that level those things. And then you said the other one was the uh, very long text. Yes, a very very long text. Yeah. So long text. I have prepared here a long text for you. I uh, a file because it's boring to have to to do that. So we can just go back to our. I'm just moving that away away again. Go back to our tests, and we would use then the prepared example method. And then we would need to guess some number. Well, the lines that it, it suggests is, you know, good enough. We, we look at it fail, we we'll let it tell us how many, and we can then decide if we want to use those values. We immediately think they're completely off. So we can just, again, go on uh, that particular thing here. Did I say first? Where's my... Uh, the comma. comma. 
So it's uh, just about as long text I can do with the parameterized texts without giving them shorter names. So this should still uh, work. And running that from here. So let's see what happens with that text. And we've never, you know, like we've never manually inserted it in the user interface. We can also do that. It's telling us a pass. No, it's actually telling us a fail. Uh, but it is telling us a fail probably because the name of the thing is too long instead of uh, of actually saying that it's it's failing for the right reasons. Let me just uh, my screens are too much. So yeah, it doesn't. Uh, well, it's failing actually for the reasons we expected it to fail. Uh, uh, nine is not the right number. Uh, 508 would be the right number. So here uh, we would have to have 508. Again, we can run it again. See the two and zero when I pay attention. Mm -hmm. then that here uh, I would need two and zero to get it to pass. And then the question is, now that the values are correct, that we have actually created the test as we think it should be. Oh, now it's running all four of them because I clicked from here. I get to watch all of them uh, uh, run. I might see accidental uh, dependencies in the application. I am exploring it in ways are definitely out of the, the thing that I was, was expecting to do. Yeah, in that case, but uh, we're now getting all of them to be green. So uh, just looking at the long text, oh, I get the wrong one. It should be on the right line. Long text and just wanting to point out the green here. So now having it writing there and it was all green. So let's go and take in this little sample of ours. Mm -hmm and put it back into our application. So I just copy pasted it there. Uh, does it look to you? Any questions? Well, you can just see the two discouraged words, but I, I have to read through a bit more to. <laughs> yeah, so de on detail level, uh, that's not where I'm asking you, but well, you are not trying to take the control right now, but can you see the entire text if you try to take control? I cannot see the very bottom of it. No, it cuts. So automation sees that it's all on this page, but have uh, originally accidentally this bug on this page, but now recently, I just yesterday put it back on this page, the bug that I had fixed here. It's one line in CSS that needs to be changed so that this bug goes away. But there is a bug that the long text actually doesn't provide scrolling, even though it is intended to provide that. And the button, like it's now visible. So we found our, our second bug. Okay. Uh, at this point, I'm thanking you for pairing. And I'll just kind of uh, uh, sum up what we, we were doing here. And I'll show here uh, the final result of what sometimes I end up with in these kind of sessions. So there is plenty of bugs in this application. Uh, that line is buggy. Uh, that line is buggy. Um, we have the long text here uh, that see. Uh, uh, even longer text uh, with uh, 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 Bible uh, turned into text. It's buggy in different ways than, than any of the ones we've seen so far. Uh, the type setters apostrophe, it's a, a, a different form of writing the, the, the apostrophe. Uh, it should work, it's buggy. Uh, the human being, uh, it's not a verb, but it uses the word being. Uh, it's buggy. Uh, the uh, different words uh, with the S's in the end, the Swiss or Regios uh, doesn't work. That's buggy. Uh, and uh, this one with two words put together with a line feed, that's buggy. So we were, I'm just demonstrating 
testing, we were doing what I call exploratory testing and using automation as part of it. And we ended up finding, well, uh, with uh, going through this, this documentation now and updating what actually works and what doesn't, we ended up finding eight or nine bugs, as I, if I count from here. And at the same time, we have now, uh, if we want to just undo all of this here, we have now uh, a test case that we can run. Uh, we can run it headless. We can run it in our test automation uh, continuously, and it will alert us when someone will fix any of the bugs that found so far. So just you know, this little thing that I was was showing, and this is this idea of of contemporary expert testing that very often we are thinking simplistic terms when we are studying exploratory testing as in kind of like the test design and execution only in the manual way because what we're looking for is learning and the the active role of the person the power of making decisions in the moment and to get to the impactful results we are losing something if we are saying that the manual and auto are separate so within contemporary exploratory testing what i'm doing in the the work is just kind of bringing these together one little step of learning to write a few lines more of code every week, maybe even every day. And I've had enough, uh, well, I have had a 15 year old who could learn this in my team and, and uh, do automation. I've had a 21 year old on, on her first job doing uh, this very same thing and, and uh, contributing this style for the entire summer. And I've had a, a, a 41 year old uh, on her first testing job ever using really the superpower of exploring and then documenting it with automation. So the foundation that I'm kind of teaching here is that I don't think you can in the modern world very long uh, anymore automate without exploring. Like the idea of just taking someone else's test cases and automating them. I think that ship has sailed a long time ago and it actually should have at least ship, uh, sailed a long time ago. But also you can't actually explore and document what you did to keep your results refreshed uh, with all the changes happening around you. Uh, you can't do that unless you are automating and uh, having, you know, just those database tests that we did today, as an example, running that across all the th three different browsers, like we can just get to, to coverage uh, of seeing things and of experiencing things, of giving the software a chance of failing in ways that we've never seen before. And what else is exploratory testing unless it is exactly this, we care for the results and we for our ability to provide those results right now in this moment, but we also care how we can do that in a month and consistently, even after people will move away. So the balance that we're looking for is how much does automation slow down? And if the collaboration we have our teams, uh, with the developers is good enough, and if we can actually build it forward, like I've managed to now do with my team, some you change the application so that exploring it with application controlling that you couldn't control become controllable and uh, or exploratory testing in this style is something that we can also share with everyone everyone in the team but it's not just automating so again kind of put here typical things that people get stuck in uh, uh, some people get stuck in reading uh, the documentation and just kind of like figuring out all the test cases. I had done a lot of that in the prep work uh, for the final result I showed you. Uh, some people uh, notice the first bug and then they spend the next hour basically on figuring out all the different ways word count can be made fail. And there's plenty of them, trust me. So that is all useful of, of working with this application. But then you don't have the same kind of coverage, same kind of knowledge that you would have if you would uh, actively bias yourself towards the automation coming in uh, early on. I call that automation is gambit. So uh, just make that choice that you can automate some pieces, even if it's not complete and it's not everything, it might actually be helpful. 
uh, if people look at the, the color coding and, and try to figure out how to count this properly, that's uh, easily something where you can spend a lot more time on automating that. And test data coming up with the things. It might be actually for a lot of people who I know in the space of automation to find all those nine problems that I just introduced in this application with that automation that I found. Most of the people that I work with who come from automation perspective actually test in a way that finds those, those problems. And I would be equally disappointed in that kind of automation effort if, if, I, if I had the option of getting actually both the results and the automation at the same time. Uh, there's more bugs. Not all of these are automatable. So I just put it in the material for you. And when you have spent enough time exploring something like this, you can tell what ideas were that were guiding you. So uh, we did a bit of research, understanding of that very uh, shallow uh, in the one hour session today. Uh, we did some work on the collecting of the data samples, but uh, actually a lot of this effort we uh, invested in actually a really nice pairing experience where the tools didn't quite collaborate as nicely as we could have, and it could have been even better, but still the two of us working together on something that I had never done before. I think it was uh, an hour well spent, uh, at least for me it was, I hope that uh, I didn't make you feel feel uncomfortable in, in, in kind of dragging you into this kind of analysis. So, so again, you know, getting that hands-on experience, it's somehow, sometimes uh, watching others do things quickly, the most valuable use of your time, but ramping up your entire team by, by either pairing or ensembling with the team might be the most valuable use of your, your time because you are not just playing the game for today, you're also playing the game for the long run. So that's contemporary exploratory testing and automation within that is just, it's a way of documenting, it's a way of extending our reach, it's a way of focusing us to look at certain details and, and uh, uh, even kind of like pinging us back when, when it starts failing at some point. So kind of like alerting us to attend and explore some more when the automation is, is failing. So that's what I wanted to share today. I'm happy to have a, a bit of a conversation with all of you now. Right. I, I'll Any just questions? say I just want to say thank you very much, Marit. It was it was a good experience, even though the, the technology did fail a little bit. It was a bit difficult to navigate, but um, no, I really appreciate the experience. Thank you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> thank you for joining. It was awesome. <laughs> awesome for me. So, any questions, comments? Does this to you so I, I see some comments here it was awesome uh, Marit of course it was <laughs> uh, it was interesting to watch uh, can you see the, uh, the questions Marit uh, yes so uh, uh, let's start with the first one that I see so uh, uh, someone is commenting that they're basically doing in their organization as well and automation according to uh, the test cases. And uh, they're asking, how does exploratory testing differ from this? Uh, is it an alternative or an additional method to find bugs? Uh, maybe they could replace some of the test cases and just explore. So usually what I do is uh, explore to create the manual test cases. Like even in the older world where I had manual test cases, uh, they are an end result of an exploratory testing. It's kind of like you're rehearsing testing and then you're writing documentation and then you're doing whatever you rehearsed. And if you stick on, uh, like, you know, later on, if you stick on doing only things you've rehearsed, it's kind of like uh, with your application, you're uh, walking always on the path on a minefield where you know that, you know, last time when I took these exams, there were no mines. And your task with the change and with the time allocation that you spend on testing this, this application, it's not just to ensure that there's no mines where they didn't used to be. It is also to find the mine that introduced anywhere else. So going either with automation or with those test cases, going on those same known paths, that's only part of the job. It's not all of the results. You would be then uh, disappointed if you would find in production 
that none of your test cases found that they might need, you know, a new user that you create, or it might need uh, uh, just a little bit different data than you had on the previous day. Or it might mean that uh, you do things either faster or slower, or you do the thing that you said you should do once, you do it uh, twice, or you do the thing that you do last, you do that first. Like all of these little changes that we can do when we are using our application, they are increasing the serendipity, the, the lucky accident that we would see a bug in our systems. And we know from our production generally, we know that there will be things that they are seeing that we are not uh, able to, to design for. So uh, in the sense, what uh, exploratory testing is that you were already using it to create your test uh, uh, cases originally, but when you are then moving forward and continuing with testing, sticking only regression uh, on a plan that you created and when the future wasn't yet even created, it's not going to give you the full results. And it might be a very expensive way to be in the future. So there was research done in Finland with students, uh, basically they noticed that with export testing, without test cases written down, and, and with the test cases written down, you could get exactly the same results out of the students. Like they found the same bugs, same severity, same kind of distribution, same kind of amounts. But the group that had to write test cases as a result of their, you know, uh, trying to understand the application, uh, there were two things that were different. The cost was twice because they had to spend also time in all of those details down. And the other thing, uh, they uh, were reporting a lot more false positives and wasting other people's times, time. Uh, they, they trusted the documentation that was created and alerted on every single difference against the document rather than uh, actively using their mind. So, so that's kind of why uh, I want to frame this uh, whole thing over the long term as export testing. So that uh, one was there. Then there's a, a question of how to introduce exploratory testing into day-to-day -day testing. Uh, can it substitute uh, this manual automation testing according to test cases? So uh, yes, well, definitely you can introduce it as kind of like just not following your own orders of what to do with the test case, just start stretching. That's the first kind of way of, of starting more exploratory aspects into your testing, but also just decide like, you know, on a Wednesday afternoon, you were supposed to do these five different test cases. Just don't do, just, you know, think of like 10 things that were in, in those test cases and use your imagination for two hours. Just put those tests aside and try doing things very form for that couple of hours. That's called time boxing as a, as a way of, of just introducing it first a little bit more into your very, uh, traditional test case oriented way of doing. So you can always take like an hour here, hour there, and maybe even bring your entire team together to a bug bash where you uh, can kind of like loan the other people's energy into your exploratory testing. Uh, some people report that in these kind of sessions, when you have like the entire team just kind of uh, having the knowledge that learned by creating the test cases and then getting the freedom, there was this one lady in Eurostar, we had a common. She said that her first inter, uh, introduction to exploratory testing was in a military context where manager all of a sudden said, like, we spent half a day doing this thing called exploratory testing. And basically, they found all the problems that they had found in the, almost the entire thing in that session. And then started questioning kind of what's the balance of where is the time, you know, well spent and writing documentation at a time when you know the least. I don't think that's the, the best approach generally, but we also need to kind of think of our future selves, not writing any documentation good either, because, well, we will need some kind of models that help us learn the same things, kind of uh, improve the situation and teach that uh, forward to new people joining our teams later. So we need both of those. And well, automation is a nice way of capturing some of that. So then uh, there's someone who's saying that uh, they've heard about uh, uh, exploratory testing sessions with like a different uh, defined duration scope and people people and uh, that that as an additional thing. 
on top of test cases like we talked about. So, so from what I showed uh, uh, that this seems like doing ad hoc exploratory testing. Uh, and does it differ or just, uh, there's so many different techniques on managing exploratory testing. This is basically that type of a question. So you can manage uh, exploratory testing by threads, which is what I just did. Like I had a thread where I uh, had the goal of, of documenting in automation. That was kind of how I had in my mind already framed the thing I was trying to do. And if there were surprises, I would just kind of start on the surprise. And uh, in my mind, I'm tracking all the things that I've started and which ones I've completed. I can even write that down on a paper. I can, anytime you want, I can visualize the threads that are ongoing. That's thread-based test management. Uh, the, the style that you are referring to here, uh, that's called session-based test management. And it was created for the purposes of framing exploratory testing for managers who don't believe that I can make sense of the threads that are ongoing. And, and, and for kind of like uh, maybe uh, uh, being a little bit more uh, worried that my testers might not want to do testing or might not know how to do testing unless they have this like a short leash in how they, they uh, report. Uh, I generally don't uh, run uh, short sessions like 90 to 60 to 90 minutes, which is what this, this technique of management technique suggests. Uh, when I manage people in testing, my unit of of, of session is one day of work. And the 15 year olds and the newbies, they will get a shorter leash. Whereas people like myself, um, well, at least my managers, my management in the whole company awards me quite much freedom and uh, being able to show what I'm thinking and how I'm thinking and, and how I'm working and basically answer these kind of questions. That's my way of kind of creating the space for doing it. Uh, I think of it as like, Okay, there's two kinds of ad hoc testing. There's like an undirected kind of like random clicking thing. And then there's a directed, you have an idea behind it. And I definitely was uh, having an idea behind it, even if I was uh, kind of looking at whatever I'm learning and changing my mind about the best based on, you know, the tools limitations or what we were learning about the application or the choices that, that Sharon was making, making for me that I could not have known in this. So definitely not following a script. And ISTGB, uh, find my name as one of the writers of the ISTGB Foundation syllabus. I think that's the right definition of exploratory testing. It is a definition of exploratory testing as a technique. And it is just basically the idea that they've never understood that uh, as an approach, kind of like an overlaying uh, thing, uh, 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 they would have needed to uh, understand the other things a bit differently um, from a scripted versus exploratory point of view. Uh, but that's a long story, so let's not go into all of that so that we can then answer the last one. Uh, really interesting year of experience in QA and hadn't heard about exploratory testing yet. How to start? Uh, well, basically, with an application, listening to it and actively learning with it. And uh, on this particular application, how to explore this really well in a structured way that I can't fit into a single hour because it takes you about a day to complete that course. Uh, there's a course, uh, co uh, courseware available for my called Exploratory Foundation, which actually introduces this very same thing. But uh, for now, for at least a week, it's going to be on robot framework uh, rather than uh, and then replacing it with this, this uh, playwright stuff that I would rather use because in automation, new uh, layers like robot framework don't actually make your life easier. They just mean that when things are failing, there's one more to debug. So at least I'm uh, a big believer in kind of staying in the languages your team uses, which is why I showed things today. That's the language that my current team is using. And uh, well, I also did some uh, JavaScript and, and TypeScript stuff this week. Because that was the other team that I worked with this week. So uh, uh, it's multiple languages for me, but might not be uh, as uh, much moving as I need to be in my, my work. And uh, how, when we, I discovered this, uh, was it for the beginning of my career? Yes, it was actually 25 years ago in my first job, I had a manager who said that my work is to do testing. Uh, they want results, which is bug reports. 
uh, I was doing localization testing. They gave me some documentation that someone had prepared and said, that's not going to be sufficient to do only that. And they introduced the concept of, of quality assurance for my testing, meaning a more senior tester will test me and give feedback. If they don't find problems after me, uh, there will be a reward for the company and for me. And if they find things, then it's, you know, it's just a learning aspect. And over time, I would hopefully grow into being better. So I have actually never done anything but exploratory testing. But I do recognize that this is not a usual experience. Most people come to it, like I told about the lady who I met in Eurostar, who uh, came to this by uh, uh, being allowed to do it one Friday afternoon and then finding all the results from it uh, in a military context. And then this other guy who was also talking about this idea that he needed to go to a conference to hear from someone like me, not me, but from someone like me who was really explaining about the results and then realized that the Excel where every morning they would start wherever they the previous day and when they got to the end, they would start from the beginning. And that was not the work they were supposed to be doing, that with the same time they could provide their results. And they learned to talk to their managers on how they could provide better results. So that's kind of the starting points. I think I got to the end of the questions. Marit, uh, we have one more question. It's uh, from Automate IT team. Uh, so we, we got really interested into your speech. And uh, the question is, uh, from your own experience, is it better for, like, I'm, I'm trying now to um, start this practice on, on my own. Is it better for myself to do it all alone or to pair with, like, a developer who does um, um, write the automated tests or with experienced QA engineer who do it, or maybe it's even a better way to learn automation. What would be your recommendation? So I learned automation by uh, ensemble testing the entire team. And I can uh, recommend it wholeheartedly. Uh, I'm very frustrated all by myself trying to figure out how to get code to run. And uh, we noticed that the senior developers were struggling with the same things sometimes that I was struggling with. And then they had answers to some of the things uh, where I did figure out the answer and I could learn it in the context of doing it. I know of no better way. Uh, trying to learn this in a, uh, it's a smaller group, but uh, you have uh, kind of like less time to, to let things and the learning sink because you're always actively uh, participating so uh, my my choice would be in an ensemble with the entire team if you the the team uses like a, you know hour an hour and a half uh, every two weeks for example on, on just you know some different kinds of of development and and testing and automation tasks even the ones who have never written a line of automation when they get to that keyboard they can be like the 12 year old girl in an agile conference where they they said that you know, this like it's a fun game. I think I can play. Uh, the the seniors, the ones who are not on the keyboard, can tell you what exactly to type. And by the time your next time on that keyboard, if the same thing is repeated, then then you could uh, to uh, uh, experience that. So yeah, I I think uh, uh, group is is. But also, you know, spending time on your own, if, if you don't have group that works with you, it's, it's better than not doing it at all. Okay, thanks. And uh, we have one more question in the chat. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. So there's uh, saying that they're a business management student and uh, wanting to move uh, with their passion and motivation and venture into QA. What's the first basic thing? no previous IT back. So in a way, uh, with the previous uh, background of the world and how to work with people, which I read into this business management side and understanding why software might exist, it might make you a, a possible tester. Uh, if you're also a little bit brave in kind of like daring to say your mind and, and you're curious and, and active learner, then that's also promise is good. Uh, but uh, for the future of testing uh, and, and newbie places in testing, 
it's going to be uh, automation first and automation included in this contemporary style. Uh, there is uh, continuously less and less places where you would get to do uh, uh, testing work without any automation directed. Finding a place where uh, your domain uh, knowledge from your life uh, is, is part of the application domain that you would be building. There might be testing places, testing positions in, in companies. And again, it depends on the team. What the local team is, is already strong on, they might need just your kind of a person uh, there, but uh, I, I can't point you to an exact location, but uh, definitely there are places where where uh, they take complete newbies and juniors, uh, also others than, than my own own projects where I have had multiple multiple complete newbies and, and trained them in the last two years that I've been at Vaisala.